Wendell Christian Church. My name is Marty Greer. Our pastor George Fuller and wife Tammy are with family out of town uh, celebrating birthdays and we are pleased to have Scott Bass in the pulpit for us today. Thank you Lisa for lighting the candles. Uh, his lovely wife Marcel is joining us in the congregation. George and Scott are friends. In fact, George texted us this morning and said to give you all his love. <coughs> Excuse me, George is an ordained minister. He resides in Wendell. He works with individual couple and family therapy, support groups and facilitation of conflict resolution, retreats, workshops, and spiritual direction. George likes to say that he lives at the intersection of justice, healing, and spirituality. Please join me in our welcome. Welcome, welcome. All, all who are here, here. Welcome. welcome. Welcome my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Welcome spirit of the risen Christ among us, welcome. Together we willingly enter communion one with another, welcome. <clears throat> Thank mm -hmm. you. join me in our call to worship. We thank you, Lord, for making us in your divine image. We are also deeply grateful that you are like a potter, shaping and molding us like clay on a spinning wheel. Hear our confession of sin and wrongdoing. Transform us with your grace. Like the psalmist who sought cleansing and pardon, we ask you to create in me a clean heart, O God and to put a new and right spirit within me. <clears throat> God, make us ready. Help us be ready. Draw our attention by your, 
divine loving presence, draw our attention to your divine loving presence. As we join in worship, as we join in learning, as we join in spiritual formation together, and as we join all our voices and hearts and minds in prayer, praying the prayer that Jesus of Nazareth taught us, our Father, Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, I am Scott. Thank you, Marty, for the welcome, and it's good to be back with y'all again. Um, and I'm so glad to have Marcel, my wife Marcel, with us. Uh, this is the time George told me that sometimes there are uh, no small children. He didn't say that there were no large children or older children or anything like that, but thought it was, uh, given what I'll be talking about a little bit later and the images that I'll be inviting you to imagine and work with, and uh, already the worship committee has put together such a beautiful, you know, from the mold me, melt me, make me, um, to have thine own way at the end. But I thought it would be a little bit of fun, maybe. I don't, when's the last time you played with Plato? Anyone? Pardon? Long, long time. By the way, I was a little concerned that if someone dropped this in the carpet and messed it up, I wouldn't be invited back. So I would ask you to be careful. I don't know if this is a church like that. I've been in some like that. But really what I want you to do is just uh, feel, feel that clay and think about what you notice. And think about I don't know, what it feels like. Is it cool or warm? I hope it's soft, but is it soft or hard? How soft? It's, uh, I hope none of it's like liquid. I did leave it in my car overnight. Had I left it in my car this afternoon, it might be turned to liquid. I don't know. And think about what you might, I mean, did anybody come to mind when you were given a ball of Play-Doh, uh, what you might do with it? Like, I think I'll make a this was the children's sermon. The children, I'm sure, would answer. So I think I'll make a snake. snake. That's the easiest thing, I think. Anything else come to mind? I think I'll make a... Anybody think of making a... Uh, a rabbit. Oh, great, great, great. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's much more ambitious than a snake, at least the way I make a snake. Um, did anyone think of making a mug to drink out of? Yeah, probably not, not with Plato. Um, we're going to be talking about the image. You know, there are many, many, many images of God represented in Scripture. Uh, and today, the one we'll be talking about the most is God as potter. And in that, we really, he was speaking to the people collectively uh, as clay. Uh, but we can also think of it without taking it too far or corrupting it, I think, with us individually, our inner parts and our outer parts uh, as clay. And so this is just to give you just a simple glimpse of childhood and hopefully something more sensory. You can even notice how it smells. Um, but as we're talking later about uh, being clay, remaining uh, 
I don't know if the word plasticity has ever been used in a sermon title before, but now it has. Uh, remain, remaining malleable, moldable, um, what it takes to keep this malleable and moldable. What, what, what if you didn't do it with it, it would be unusable by the end of the day or the end of the week. So just reflect on that, I hope. Think about uh, pressure. Um, what kinds of pressure are helpful and harmful? Things like that. So that is our children's moment. I look forward later to seeing your rabbit. If you don't change your mind, and by the way, one of the things even our scripture tells us is that God is talking about, I can do this, but if it messes up, I can do something else. If I can do this, but if circumstances work out a certain way, I can change my mind and do something else. Um, remembering always, one of the lines from the psalm is that we are wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. Um, I wish I had passed out mirrors rather than Play-Doh and asked you to look in the mirror and, and say, I am wonderfully made. But I didn't want to go too, too far with that. It is a pleasure to be here. And next in our worship is our pastoral prayer. Marty, if I get off on anything, just throw something at me or get my attention. Um, so I want to invite you to, uh, first of all, because part of what I'm talking about today is being available, being present. Um, and I want to start out our pastoral prayer with a moment of silence in which you call to mind um, or let come to mind or let rise up from your heart, whatever it is that you would like to hold in God's presence, that you would perhaps like God's hand to be set upon in some shaping way. So first, just a moment of silence as you let come to mind, let rise out of your heart, those things you would like God to mold and shape in your life individually, in our lives collectively, in the lives of this community. So let us pray first in silence. Oh God, so often when we try to pray, maybe we're too busy or distracted by many things and don't even know what to pray about or for, what to bring into your presence. Then when we're in the midst of others and try to think of what we ought to bring, or need to bring, or would be helpful to bring to you. Sometimes our minds go blank. Sometimes we wonder what's the use. Sometimes we wonder, are you listening? Sometimes we wonder, do you answer? And yet, we come to you in faith and trust at this time together to lift up to you our concerns and present them to you. So, Lord, we come to bring to you what comes to our minds and our hearts of illness, and injury, of misfortune, of challenging times collectively and challenging times in our families and challenging times individually. Sometimes we bring to you challenging times that we don't even dare let anyone else know about, but we dare bring those to you and hold them in your presence many times when we don't even know what words to put on our prayers. And so we come to you now with, with all these concerns, concerns that we've shared with others, concerns that we haven't, concerns that we have words and thoughts about and feelings about, concerns and praises and joys and celebrations. Sometimes we have words and sometimes we don't. But scripture teaches us that your spirit understands. Your spirit can turn groanings and sighs 
into powerful prayers. We thank you for that, Lord, because we know that we are not enough on our own. and Our prayers often feel inadequate. But it's not about our adequacy individually, but our coming together collectively to present ourselves to the one who made us, the one who continues to make us. We give you thanks. We wait expectantly for how you might respond and how we might respond to our own prayers. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Cern Lewis in the bulletin. These are people who are, have asked for or someone else has asked for us to pray for them. Uh, it's also a time for praises if you have a praise that, that you would like to make. Um, George did ask that we uh, add to this list those experiencing the flooding in Jackson, Mississippi. Are there any others? Rachel? Thank you, Rachel. In case you were unable to hear her, she said that she and Rachel, that she and Mitchell did experience a miscarriage, um, but she is in a place of acceptance, uh, feels the strength, love, support from this uh, church community. Uh, we do love you. We agree with you, and um, we will be there for you. Thank you. Are there any other? Anne? Okay, thank you. In case you were unable to hear, Ann Harris said that um, Alice Hall has COVID, so we want to keep her in our prayers, and that Claudia and Donna are not feeling well. They plan to join us, but they were unable to today. Thank you. Ben? Thank you, Ben. Um, ben was talking about his brother-in-law, John Todd, who um, has uh, attended this church before him and, and his wife, Ann, and also um, his mother, Judy Todd, who was a big part of our church, that he is out of intensive care, uh, which is certainly a praise, and he has, still has a long road to go, a long way to go, excuse me, because of um, extended COVID. Um, so thank you for that update. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Uh, we'll just review your list and keep everyone in your prayers. <laughs> We will have our communion hymn and the table of Christ is open to us all. Christ himself invites us all to share the bread and the cup. All of us are welcome and all of each one of us is welcome.
The hymn of communion is hymn number 339, Just As I Am. As we take this bread this morning, help us to understand and know we said the very solemnly, solemnly of that. And Lord, enter our hearts, our minds, and help each and every one of us to see things through your eyes and have the compassion that you have especially for those less fortunate. And we pray in the precious, holy name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. May this bread be for us the body of Christ. Take, eat, all of us.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare to take this cup, help us to know the significance of this cup, that Jesus died for us. Around us, we see all things changing. Some days are good, some days are not so good. Some days we're happy, other days not. But Lord, the one thing in our lives that remains constant is your love. Help us to feel your love, to feel your arms around us, to lift us up when we fall, to help us through those times that are not so happy. And Lord, most of all, help us to remember that Jesus died for us and that we have the promise of everlasting life if we just believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May this cup be for us the blood of Christ. Drink it, all of us. Our response to God's generosity is gratitude and generosity. And this is our opportunity, one of our many opportunities, to respond through gifts of tithes and offerings. May God bless these tithes and offerings that we provide at this time. Scripture this morning is from Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. Give me a second to turn to my Bible. And then in the Psalms, 139, 1 through 7, and 13 and 14, if you want to be looking those up. First Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. I have to put my bifocals on here. In my older age, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house. There I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, he was working away at the wheel. But this jar that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand. So he made it into another jar, as it seemed right for him to do. The word of the Lord came to me, House of Israel, can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? This is the word, the Lord's declaration, just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, House of Israel. Psalms 139.
one through seven, I believe it is. And then 13 and 14. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my stays, my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on, the, on me. This extraordinary knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty, lofty. I, I am unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? In 13 and 14, in the same chapter. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Praise God for his wonderful words. It's good to be back, and uh, it's a little over a year ago when I was here before, of course, I, you know, I live in Wendell Falls, Marcel and I moved to Wendell Falls about a year and a half ago now, and uh, I circulate around here a little bit, may have bumped into something from the grocery store or wherever, but uh, it's really good to be back. I really appreciate George entrusting me with the opportunity, and appreciate you entrusting me with the opportunity on this Nice Labor Day weekend. That is, uh, many, many things, options you have. I, um, I know that I got things out of order a little bit with the pastoral prayer, and I immediately felt myself starting to sort of kick myself or beat me up, but beat myself up a little bit. Has anybody ever done that? Uh, been a little bit hard on yourself for something you've done, big or small, sometimes small. Because in the big scheme of things, that little mistake just gave me a little additional material for the message um, and caused no harm, I hope. Um, it's about progress and sometimes about the process and not about necessarily, not always about the product or about perfection or some other things that I want to think about today. But when I, uh, when George called me and, uh, you know, we were chatting and said, yeah, I'm available that weekend and would love to. Um, then I, I, he reminded me that this church uses the lectionary oftentimes, and I looked and immediately saw that passage from Jeremiah chapter 18 about the potter and the clay, and I remember hearing many, many sermons about that throughout my years, but this time, and, and it would have been easy to say, oh, that again. I, I know that's probably not the, the, the most uh, spiritually mature way to respond to it, but but I was so excited because just a few months ago, my wife, Marcel, uh, started potting, potting. She became a potter. She, she started going to a pottery studio and playing with clay and doing things and learning the process and actually has become quite good at it. And um, I won't put her on the spot too much by saying much more about, about how she might even sell some of the things she's made. But um because I know she can be harder on herself. But uh, during the process, any, does anyone here, has anyone here been to a pottery studio or, or done, I mean, Plato, Plato counts if you did it earlier today, but a pottery studio, I mean, real, real potter's play. Um, when Marcel started, I thought it sounded like a neat thing. I've been in, and I think she took it on and has, would openly say she took it on as a part of her own uh, to give her a, a recreational, but also, and more importantly, a creative uh, outlet, and also as a part of, of has a there sometimes things like that have a very therapeutic and healing uh, aspect to them. And then I didn't know she was going to get me started watching pottery on TV. Did you know there was pottery on TV? Um, there is, and it's a lot more interesting than it sounded to me at first. It's uh, called The Great Pottery Throwdown, one of the television options that are available to us now. 
Um, and uh, it's a, sort of like a cooking show. Most of us by now have seen a cooking show or at least know what one is, but it's kind of like a cooking show, except it's all about pottery and the process of pottery. And I got so fascinated. It was the last thing I thought I would want to watch more than about one episode of, but it's like, you can't get enough of it. Um, and then in preparing for the sermon today, I asked Marcel, who does her work out of uh, Zebulon Pottery located in Wendell. <laughs> you didn't know that. Confused with some folks, I'm sure. Um, I said, but can I, could you take me in there so I can get a better feel for what I'm talking about on Sunday? Because I can you know, talk about it. I just needed to feel the clay in my hand and sit at the wheel. So if you don't know, um, some of the things I'm going to say today uh, are about pottery, but this is not a pottery lesson. Um, there are so many wonderful analogies, lessons for life um, that relate to this passage of scripture and to thinking about pottery. Um, one of those I want to talk to get you, ask you to, well, but before that, actually, uh, the title, I was afraid when I sent the title in, someone would think it was a typo because I sent letting into shape. And I'm like, somebody's going to see that and think I meant getting into shape and they're going to change it. And that'll be no big deal. Small, small mistake. But but letting into shape is not a typo because um, I want to talk some of, more about the, the more receptive and some might even say passive side of our, our lives, our growth, our spiritual development. You think about that lump of clay and uh, you might think it's a completely inanimate, unanimated, uh, no life in it uh, substance. Uh, I'll challenge that a little bit today, but, um, but thinking about that, uh, it's about receptiveness. In the analogy of the potter and the clay, uh, it's as if everything, all the clay's got to do is sit there. Again, I'll challenge that just a little bit today. I'm not saying that activity, that action, that engagement is not important. Uh, any more than saying just if I'm emphasizing the front left tire of my car, getting it care and attention and making sure it's okay, doesn't mean I don't think the other three tires are important. It's just that this one sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, this, this, this wheel gets overlooked sometimes. So um, think about a little bit. I, I thought about also in uh, a, a, a quote that has made a lot of impression on me. Um, because it has to do with the relationship between what some might say passivity, I'm going to say being receptive and being active, uh, making efforts. And uh, it's a, a quote from a psychologist named Thomas Moore. And he says that it's his conviction that slight shifts in imagination have more impact on living than major efforts at change. Deep changes in life follow movements in imagination. And it's not to say that effort's not never important, not never, not ever important. Um, but what about that idea of slight shifts of imagination? Uh, one of the words I want to put before you today as we think about pottery and lessons we can get from our relationship with the great potter is possibility possibility. So think about even slight shifts in imagination and imagining yourself, if at all possible, from time to time, perhaps even in your time of prayer or time of meditation at home, maybe you want to say, you know, I'm just a lump of clay today, you know, make something out of me. Um, sometimes is the best offering of our lives that we can make. But another thing, so as we imagine ourselves as clay, but clay with some responsibility uh, and God as potter, um, you know, many, many images of God, father, we've referred to God as father already. We referred to God in the service as creator. And of course, potting is a creative activity. Uh, there are images of God that are often overlooked and not preached that refer to God as, a, as having motherly compassion for us, womb like compassion for us. Um, there's even one or two about presenting God as a mother hen. Um, but today it's about God as potter, 
artist, designer, maker, and remaker. Think about for a moment what you're made of. Sometimes in services in the season of Lent, perhaps even here on Ash Wednesday at the beginning of Lent, um, sometimes as the ashes are put upon one's head, uh, the, say, the, the, the applier of the ashes will say, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. Referring to when Adam, as Genesis tells the story, as it presents our creation, being made from dirt, from dust. Um, and to dust we will return, not as a hopeless thing, but with hope that it's a humbling, an humbling thing. But clay, dust, I don't know about you, Marcel would probably tell me quickly that uh, she probably can't mold much out of dust. But out of dust with some moisture, with some uh, malleability, with some plasticity, um, she did not make this beautiful thing out of Play-Doh, but it was a lump of clay that, in my opinion, was not prettier than this lump of clay, was looked a little less impressive than this. And I, if I had a, a, if this was on computer, I'd zoom in for you to see what a, a lovely, simple uh, thing of beauty and usefulness was made out of something that started looking like less than this. But without malleability, without moisture, without a certain amount of vulnerability. Vulnerability is not popular, but there's a vulnerability involved in being malleable clay as opposed to being too rigid or too dry. And how do we encourage, increase our malleability? There's a little bit more how-to in this lesson today than I've ever presented in a, a lesson from a pulpit. And one of those is a mindset. Our mindsets are part of what increase or decrease our malleability and the moistness of our lives. Whether we're focused uh, on gratitude, for example. And I'm not one of those folks who said, oh, don't think about the bad stuff, only think about the good stuff. No, I say, think about the good stuff too, not only the bad stuff, uh, not only the problems that need addressing, the things that need fixing, the things that need changing, the things that aren't finished about me yet, but also about the things that I'm grateful that I have in my life and the things that have been shaped in me already. So gratitude is one of the things that we can increase our plasticity and our malleability. Um, moisture, uh, I, 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 that's one that I hope you'll let your imaginations, you know, maybe shifts in your imagination. Uh, dust without moisture is not very useful. Um, we, without, if I don't drink enough water in the day, I can't even think by middle of the afternoon. Um, There's so many things like that. And even the simple promise, very practical promise, of remembering to drink a glass, a, 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 a take a sip of water could become an act of prayer for us. It's like, um, I'm not feeling very malleable today. Uh, my family thinks I'm not very malleable today. <laughs> they think I'm too rigid, too dry, too brittle, whatever it is. And maybe my prayer could be the simple act of sipping a glass of water. Perhaps accompanied with the words thought or said, you know, make me more moldable. Let me be. And that's a letting, you know, I can't make that water do anything to me. What that water does to me is mostly a function of what I allow it to do to me. So remembering uh, the idea of plasticity, moistness, malleability, and how do we cultivate a mindset for that? A, a, con, a mindset of availability. Um, there's a line from, I think last year when I was here, I shared that uh, part of my journey that I never set out to accomplish or never expected was uh, having difficulty with use of alcohol. It got out of control in my life, a period of my life. And so I'm glad to say that it's not the case any longer. But I learned so much from those who were struggling with addictions 
And there's a line from uh, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's some other groups that have rephrased the line a little bit. But it, it, it just, the part of the line is, became entirely ready to let God. It goes on to say, remove defects of character or remove unconscious behaviors. Or, but what does it mean to become, and how does it feel to become entirely ready to let God? Meditating upon that alone perhaps would increase our malleability. The other thing I want to talk about as we move toward the end, talk a little about plasticity and malleability, but it's about pressure. I can only imagine in a room with more than one person in it, maybe even with a room with only one person in it, that somebody in that room is feeling some kind of pressure. I wonder where you're feeling pressure. Uh, pressure can come from inside, as it did start, as I, I felt it when I did the pastoral prayer out of order. There was so much pressure in me, I was just working to not show it. <laughs> and it was all created from inside of me. Marty didn't frown at me or scold me, or at least I didn't see her. Um, I didn't see any mun flinch. But it was all inside of me. And how often do we create pressure from inside of us? And what's the quality of that pressure? Is the pressure we create inside of us helpful? Or is it unhelpful? And being that simple. Um, pressure that the potter puts on the clay has so much to do. It's, it's almost like a conversation between the, the resistance of the clay and the pressure of the potter or a dance between the pressure of the potter and the resistance and malleability of the clay. The pressure and pressures from outside. And it's easy to see there's, there's, there's all kinds of pressure. A punch is a type of pressure. So is a caress. Mashing and squeezing is a type of pressure. Tearing even is a type of pressure applied. And so is massage. So is a gentle stroke to the face. So is a calming heading motion that I like to do on the back of my cat or a gentle type pressure under the chin of my cat. You learn a lot about types of pressure wanted and unwanted from a cat, by the way. So I invite you to think. This morning, imagine ourselves. How do we remain more malleable? How do we maintain our plasticity? How do we keep ourselves moist enough? How do we keep ourselves vulnerable and available and ready enough? And what do we do with the pressure? Not just pressure that comes from inside, but pressure that comes from outside. Wanted pressure and unwanted pressure. Pressure from uh, the death of a loved one. Pressure from the loss of a job. Pressure from a pandemic that nobody wanted. Pressure from all sorts of changes in life that oftentimes have a habit of coming when it's least convenient. But it's pressure that we have some say so into how it will mold us. Part of that conversation between the clay and the potter, that part of that dance between the pressure malleability, the designer, the artist, the creator. The last thing I want to say is a very specific thing, an, an invitation to a spiritual practice for you in the days ahead. Perhaps you've already heard of something called centering prayer. And it's such a simple, simple thing. By the way, if you go to the pottery studio and you want to use one of the wheels, one of the first things you got to get right is centering the clay on that wheel. Um, if you've ever driven, driven a car with a tire out of alignment or with a big bulge of some kind is out of round or something like that, and it's wobbly, 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 and one of the first things is the idea of centering that clay. And I even found doing that so meditative and prayerful. But centering prayer is the idea that you first place yourself in the presence of the great potter, of, of God, of the divine. You come up with a single word, a sacred word, that when your thoughts inevitably distract you, 
and you start thinking about, oh, why am I sitting here for 10, 5, 10, 20 minutes? Why am I not doing this, that? I forgot to do this. I forgot to do that. But every time those thoughts inevitably distract, just to return, have a sacred word. For example, the sacred word could be potter. Or maybe God is potter, I am clay, a sacred phrase. And just to sit with that phrase for, again, 5, 10, 20 minutes or something like that, every time distracted, just using that centering sacred phrase or word to remind us to be malleable and to feel the loving, shaping, and crafting of the divine. So there's so much more I could say that I got thinking last night that, um, that I got like a series of workshops out of this, but I'm not going to present you the series of workshops today. I also felt like that it was like a little unpolished, a little this, a little unfinished, and I've been told that a good message from the pulpit uh, it's more like a, a flight, an uh, airplane flight. It really, the most important things are a smooth takeoff and a good sound landing. <clears throat> but I was thinking, imagining things in the creative experience of potting isn't so much like that, because the truth is that we aren't made and done. We are made and continually, continually, continually remade. We never get too old to be malleable. We never get too broken to be remade. We never get too messed up by our own actions or thoughts or words or by those of anyone to be remade. We're never quite finished. The old children's song I remember said, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun up above, the Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me and you. So, perfect way to end this experiment in imagination today is not to end it at all, but to invite you to remain open to the evolving process of a loving God longs to shape you, continue to shape you gently and beautifully into what he still can be. Amen. <clears throat> the hymn of commitment continues in part with the analogy of the potter and clay. It's hymn number 588. Have thine own way. And as is the tradition of this faith community, it's a time that we welcome those, anyone who would wish to make a profession of faith or unite with this church or transfer membership to do so. Or as I like to say, whether you walk the aisle or not, it's a time to consider your relationship with God, with Christ, and this community. And you're welcome to make commitments and recommitments where you are, and by walking the aisle. Hymn number 588, Have Thine Own Way.
as we go. May we remain aware of the indwelling, shaping divine within us, among us, above us, and below us, and beside us. And may we take the love of Christ to all we meet. Through us, may they meet our maker and shape. so much for joining us today and we do appreciate your message that you, you sent to us gave to us and we will prayerfully follow that i'm sure um as far as announcements if you will check your bulletin there's a lot in there uh in addition i wanted to let you know that there is an elders meeting on thursday september the 22nd at 7 p.m at church and also that the bible study on wednesday mornings will no longer be on zoom does anyone else have any other announcements? Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm here.